Hello everybody. Um, my name is Jackie. I'm an art student and a member of the committee artists and residents or excuse me. I'm a member of the community artists and residency committee, an extension of the visiting artist series and a group made up of faculty, students and staff in art, photography, fashion, graphic design, architecture, the Cleve Carney Museum of Art and our campus natural areas. I have the pleasure today of introducing our first visiting artist in residence this year, Susan Kurt. Susan is a camera wielding Chicago based <laughs> artist, uh, Chicago based botanist. She is passionate about prairies and insects, having been raised volunteering at the College of DuPage restoration area with her parents from an early age. As a photographer and scientist, Susan hopes her viewers are awed by the overlooked insects around them and inspired to protect their local habitat. Susan holds an AS degree from, co from COD in addition to degrees in botany and prairie ecology. She will be spending the next two weeks on campus sharing her passion for prairies, insects, and photography with students and the community. So let's give a hand for Susan Kite. And thank you for the introduction. Assuming my mouse goes forward. Okay. So I want to say thank, uh, thank you everyone for coming. I, this is a very big hall, so the theater. And I'm glad to see that it is filled up quite nicely. And today I'm going to be talking about prairies, especially the prairie here on the College of DuPage campus. I'm going to be talking about insects and how I use my photography for outreach. So I'm trying to combine my love of science and biology with reaching out to people and trying to educate people about these different insects and these different habitats. And I want to thank the College of DuPage for letting me come here for this artist in residency. Without College of DuPage, I probably wouldn't be here, not just for this residency, but I may not have gotten my degree in biology here. And to really explain this, I have to go back to the beginning, back to 1967. And this is the year College of DuPage began. And this man right here, William Gooch, is one of the very first deans here on campus. A couple years later, Russell Kurt shows up on campus, and he's in the biology department. They get to know each other. And Bill Gooch here says, you know what? I think you should meet my daughter, Pamela. That's right. And wrong button there. And so here's Pam, and they get together, and they're like, hey, we really like each other, which is great for me because they got married, and along comes my brother, and then along comes me. And so when I say thank you, College of DuPage, I really mean it because I wouldn't be here without the university or without the college. I was not call this the university. It feels that way. So there's my mom, and she's out helping in one of our prairie restorations here on campus. And while all this is happening, Russell becomes friends with the person right down the street, Ray Schulenberg, at the Morton Arboretum. And Ray Schulenberg, 60 years ago this year, started restoring prairie on an old farm field on the Arboretum grounds, now known as the Schulenberg Prairie. And this was really rare at the time because 60 years ago, not a lot of people have heard of prairies. They didn't hear of grasslands. They didn't really care about the native plants. But he understood that there's been this great loss of these ecosystems and we're losing all the plants and the animals, including the insects that live here. And to give you an idea on how much of this prairie has been lost, picture a third of the United States and up into Canada into Saskatchewan. So we got Canada all the way down to Texas, from the Rocky Mountains all the way east to the Chicago region. That was prairie. Those were grasslands, tall grasses with lots and lots of flowers, and lots of lots of insects and animals living in that habitat. And you think, well, surely we still have a lot of it left. 
but we don't. What was discovered in the 1800s is that this soil that develops under grasses is amazing farmland. And we can grow crops, we can grow wheat and soybeans and corn and sunflowers, and they're gonna do amazing. And we plowed them all under. Here is Illinois. This is the original map of vegetation. The green is forested areas, wooded areas. Everything else you see on that map was grassland filled with lots and lots and lots of fabulous organisms. By 1978, we went from 22 million acres of grassland in Illinois to 2,600 acres. Less than one-tenth of 1% 1 is left in the prairie state. And that was 78. We have even less now. And they're still getting plowed under. They're still getting paved over, these remnant areas. And so Ray Schulenberg is one of the first people in the Chicago area that said, we have to do something about it. And we can't remake an ecosystem that took thousands and thousands of years. This ecosystem that is the most endangered ecosystem on the planet. There's less than 1% left in North America. We always think the rainforest must be the most endangered. No, it's right here at our feet. Right literally underneath our feet, paved over. It's kind of sad, right? But anyway, so he comes along and he starts it, and my dad, Russ Kurt, he gets to become friends with him, and he says, I think this is a great idea. I'm gonna convince College of DuPage to start one of the very first campus prairies ever made here in the US, okay? We're one of the very first community colleges that had a natural area like this installed. Awesome, right? 48 years ago, 1974. And here's Ray Schulenberg out here on the current prairie. And if you didn't know, the SRC, little bit of a brown dot behind his head, uh, this was before they clad the building in white. So it's much brighter now <laughs> than it was in the past. And this took a lot of work. So he had to have a bunch of students go out and collect seed. And I know we have the prairie ecology class in here, so that might look a bit familiar to you. Bit updated clothing, though. And the seed was spread all over the place. This would have been in the Kurt Prairie, which is where we're going to have a walk next Wednesday on the 28th. So you can see that being installed. And you can also see not only seeding, but you can see people planting plants that were grown in the campus greenhouses in the horticulture department. And then you can also see some of the watering trucks that were used to keep these plants going. And there's also a lot of irrigation equipment. Now, at the 50th anniversary in 97, I started getting emails from a lot of people telling me, have you been to the college lately? Because your dad is now blown up larger than life on one of the walls. It was a little nerve wracking. But I did come and see it. So he's up there. And you can see the original picture off to the side of him working with some of the classes here at the College of DuPage Prairie, which is a learning natural area. This is an area meant for students and meant for the public to go out to. And of course, we'll also see a little bit more about burning right now. So luckily, unbeknownst to everybody, in 2020, in March of 2020, right before everything shut down, the prairie was burned. And you can see the SRC building in the background, that white building. Or not the SRC, um, our building right here. And then this is by the SRC at the Kurt Prairie that we turned into. And we burn these prairies because, one, it helps keep down invasive species from usually Europe and Asia. Two, the native plants love it. They love, love, love prairie. They'll bloom great. The blooms are great afterwards. It's amazing. And three, they're really fun to photograph or to use a drone. And if you are one of the photography students or you're a science student, start to look for grants because that drone, that's from a grant that I got for equipment. I've gotten several other pieces of equipment for equipment also. They're out there. And then there's also grants for signage and restoration. Um, you just have to look for them sometimes. Now, I grew up in the prairie. Here's me 
I'm in my backyard growing up, probably one of the first backyard prairies in the area. And I like to joke that I basically was raised on campus. And so here I am with irrigation equipment and my brother. Uh, you can see it wasn't all hard labor. And I got to also go on field trips. And so here's to a sand, remnant sand prairie here in Illinois, close to the Mississippi River, where you get to find fun things like bull snakes, completely harmless. And just to make sure that you think uh, it's a one-time occurrence, it's not. Uh, that's myself out in Iowa when I was doing my master's research. And if you like snakes, I apologize, that is not the proper way to hold a snake. I know that now. But these are huge, these are one of our biggest snakes and they are quite fun to find. You will not find them on campus, don't worry. Okay? There's garter snakes on campus and that's about it. And they eat the mice. So people often ask me, well, how did you get into photography? Isn't this supposed to be a photography talk? And growing up, I always said, I want to be like my dad. Anytime somebody asked, I'll be six, and I want to be like my dad. And I'm like, okay, I like prairies, I like restoration, check. Teaching, check. Photography, you betcha. So here I am, and my dad took a lot of photographs, and I always wanted to follow in that footsteps, those footsteps also. And so I took inspiration from him, and I gotta tell you, I really got into photography. So, but I didn't start in the digital age. I'm a bit of a dinosaur in that. I do shoot digital now, but I started off with slides and regular film negatives, which are in boxes in my house, so easy to pull out for this illustration. And when I went digital, I didn't go digital with an actual camera that I could carry around. It was actually through a job. After I finished up my coursework for my master's, I got a job in a laboratory. And one of my jobs was to actually use a digital camera on a microscope to take pictures of our buscular mycorrhizal fungi in prairie roots. And so most plants, 80 to 90% of plants, actually have an association, this close association with plants, and they exchange nutrients and sugars and everything else. And neither would survive very well without the other. It's quite a great system. And so this was my introduction not only to digital photography, but macro photography. And my problem was I could do it on a microscope, but I couldn't do it out in the field. But these images could be used for education and for outreach in essence because they'd be used for presentations, they'd be used for journal articles, um, and other things along those lines. But still don't, sorry about that, um, still don't have a camera that I can really use on, or a lens I can really use on my camera. And it was really frustrating. I'm all, taking pictures of landscapes, taking pictures of flowers, and I really want to take pictures of the insects on them. And I got into insects, and I started to really like ants. And so I took this ant course in 2014 out in Arizona in August. It was hot. And one of the people there had this lens that you see right up there. It is a true macro lens. It starts off one to one, so the image in that lens is the actual size of whatever you're taking a picture of. And then you can magnify things up to five times with this lens that I can carry outside with me. Mind blown, okay? And this person had borrowed it by a guy named Alex Wild, who is one of the really top insect ant photographers out there. So I look him up and I'm like, oh, cool. He does workshops. There's a group of photographers that like to take pictures of insects and they do workshops. Guess what I started to do? Going to these workshops. They have one domestic every year and in case anybody is interested in this, they do have one scholarship every year for students for a four day workshop that would cover the uh, photography lessons, food and lodging. So it is something to look into if any of you guys are interested. And I go out there, I just got my lens, had never used it, but I wanted to. 
And so one of the first five pictures I took was this ant, these ants. And they're battling it out because they're from rival colonies. And so they're trying to kill each other. But it's kind of a fun picture, other, other than that. And my goal there was to focus on just a couple of things to learn to do well. Because when you get into a new field, when you get into a new class, you're like, oh, this is amazing. I want to learn it all. And you can get overwhelmed. And so I'm like, no, I got to learn how to use this lens. And then I'm going to go back. And I did. And the next time I went back, I started to do a little bit of studio work. So this first one was in California. This is Delaware. And those are horseshoe crab eggs that we collected on the beach and brought back into a room and set up a studio setup that we could take pictures of those eggs. And I wish I took a video at the time because you could actually see the little horseshoe crabs flipping around inside the eggs. It was adorable. And you can see that my ant photography had improved by this time also. And then I just went out this summer and trying to work a little bit more on some studio techniques, which is one of the things I'm planning on doing while I'm here on campus, bringing things back to one of the studios and doing some work there and practicing on some of the techniques I've learned at some of these workshops. And so these are the same images. That's the full frame image, and then this is the one cropped in of the sheephead moth. Horrible name, beautiful moth. But I want to bring it a little bit closer to here. And the first picture I want to talk about is the one, probably my least favorite on here, I'm not going to lie. But I took this about a week and a half ago. And you can see the white flowers with the bee pollinating it. This is a rare state endangered plant here in Illinois. It's only naturally found from two counties, American Burdett. Um, and when I went out, I knew where it was, took some pictures of it when I was here about a week and a half ago, getting pollinated. And then I go online to a site called Illinois Wildflowers, which I really like because they also give information on the organisms that use the plant. And it basically said, we don't know much about the pollinators on the plant. But now I have two different insects, two different bee species, that are pollinating it. And I can get them identified to species. So I have just increased our knowledge of what pollinates and what uses this plant, which is pretty cool. And I find I'm doing that all the time with my photography. Now, the other ones are just some pretty pictures. <laughs> and a couple from this year. Uh, the other one I took this year was just down the road. We have a great, from my house in Indiana, there's a great remnant wetland, and that's probably the most common bee I photograph in this area. It's a brown belted bumblebee on Joe Pye weed. And we have those here on campus. We also, in my yard, the bottom two pictures are from my yard. I have the lemon cuckoo bee. I think it's one of the prettiest bees we have in our area on one of our native plants. Blazing Star, which you'll see more pictures of as I go through this. And cuckoo bees and cuckoo birds lay their eggs in the nests of other animals, of other, in this case, another insect, other bumblebees. And they make the other bumblebees raise their young. Kind of tricky, right? <laughs> and by having these, I know not only do I have a healthy population of this really important po pollinator, but I've also provided habitat in my yard for enough of the bees that it needs to lay its eggs in so that both species can actually survive and thrive and pollinate my plants. And then the last one is just to show you, you don't have to have all this clunky equipment all the time that I love. The last one of the Luna Moth is just with my cell phone. And there's going to be a few other cell phone photos here. Okay. And I like the Luna moth because not only is it beautiful, but this group, this belongs to a group of moths that don't have working mouth parts as adults, so they can't eat. So that Luna moth right there, he's only going to live maybe a week. He's there to reproduce and die. And they're beautiful. And here is my tip, whether you're using a cell phone or a camera, camera, camera. Always get the eyes in focus. There's one rule that I follow. There's all those rules. You learn the rules to ignore the rules. 
But this is the one I always say to pay attention to. Get the eyes in focus. Crouch down, get on eye level with whatever you're taking a picture of, whether it's a buffalo, don't get too close, or a mouse or an insect. Look at their eyes. Or in the case of the Luna moth, look at those little eye spots that are on the eyes. They're in nice sharp focus. That's what our eyes are drawn to. And if the eye is in focus, we can ignore some of the blurriness that's in the rest of that insect. There is blurriness in all of these insects on here, but you don't notice it right away because the eyes are in focus. That's my big tip for anyone wanting to take a picture of any sort of animal. But as you can guess, I like the education part. And I like the ones where you can have multiple insects helping out the same plant. And in this case, I have squirrel corn in my yard. This is a really nice woodland spring flower. So it's getting pollinated by a bee there. The plant produces seed. And then what happens with a lot of our spring woodland flowers is if I look at the seeds it produces, it looks like it has kind of like a really funky wig on, right? These like whitish tentacly looking things. And that's actually chock full of nutrients that the ants collect for their babies. And so the ants take the seeds back to their nest, they cut all that off, they feed it to their babies, and then like, what do I do with the seed? We can't eat it. And they cart it off to their garbage dump because nests need to be kept clean, just like our houses. And they have an area where they put all their trash. And then the seeds germinate and they now have a whole pile of nutrients to help them out as they start their lives. It's pretty cool, right? And so you have this big cycle with a lot of our insects and plants. And another big reason, if you're like, oh, why am I listening to all this information about insects? And why do I care that insect populations are declining and declining rapidly in many parts of the world? In some places, 50, 70% less insects. And the example often given is if you're old enough and you ever took a road trip, you'd have to stop now and again at a gas station not to fill up your car, but to scrape off the insects, coating your windshield. I can't remember the last time I stopped specifically to clean a windshield, though. And it's because the insects are declining so rapidly in just the last few decades alone. And you're like, okay, great, I don't like bugs, no problem. But this is what we need in order to pollinate the plants, including the food that we eat. And if you like birds, I think more people like birds than insects, guess what a major food source is? The insects. So in essence, I'm basically giving a talk about bird food. And this doesn't mean that all birds eat a lot of insects, but all those nesting birds that come up here, all those songbirds we like to attract to our houses with bird feeders, they can't feed their babies bird seed. They can't feed them those things. They need soft insects. Every single baby bird, every single chick needs thousands of insects to make it to adulthood. And if we don't have insects, we don't have birds. And this is why there has been a decline in bird species of three billion birds since 1970. We should literally have in the United States three billion more birds. This is one of the reasons. There's a lot of others, don't get me wrong, but not having enough food for their young is definitely a driving factor for this decline in birds. So you lose the food, you lose the birds that eat them. And then you lose some of the food that we like to eat also. Now this can also go into some of the insects that most people like. Can I assume that most people here like monarch butterflies? We saw a couple earlier today with the class. They're really pretty butterflies. And uh, this is a picture of a monarch caterpillar. They only eat milkweeds. And this is one at the Indiana Dunes Beach with Lake Michigan in the background. This is a wide angle shot. So you can get a little bit of sense of their habitat 
um, instead of just one of those pictures where you have a very blurred out background. And the next day, an international organization that helps um, consult with different countries around the world on the status of their plants and animals and fish, et cetera, said that, hey, the monarch's endangered. It has, the monarch populations, just like those other species, have dipped 70 to 90% in the last few decades. So we're seeing a lot less. So there's a big push right now. Plant milkweed, plant milkweed, plant milkweed. But I like to expand that a little bit. Don't just plant milkweed in your yards or along roadsides. Plant plants for the adults also. Here's that blazing star again. This is at the end of my driveway. I can go out at the end of my driveway and see so many butterflies. Because you don't need to just provide the food for the caterpillar. You need to provide food for the adult. And that's what you can attract to your yard if you have just a couple different native plants. And of course, it's not just in natural areas. It's not just things you can do in your yard. It's things you can do on places like COD. In the Kurt Prairie, there is a monarch on one of our native rosin weeds. So these big habitats are also very important for these different types of conservation. Now, a lot of times, I don't know what I took a picture of. I'm not an entomologist. I went into plants. And so one tool that I will use is iNaturalist. It has a really great app on your phone, so you can just take a picture with your phone and upload it, and it'll give you suggestions. And I just boxed in College of DuPage. I've apparently taken 35 pictures here and uploaded them over the years. And including the two that I mentioned earlier on this rare plant we have growing here. And it's great because it'll give you suggestions and you, you click some buttons and you upload it, it's done. And people can comment. They can say like, oh hey, I agree with your, recommend, what, with your suggestion. I agree with what you think it is. Or hey, I think it's really this. And if enough people agree, it goes to research grade. And at that point, researchers will, could use your data, use that picture you just snapped on your cell phone of an insect, a plant, an animal, a fish, whatever it happens to be, and they can use that for science. And you've become a citizen scientist. So it's a pretty powerful tool. I also use Facebook. I will often put up, like, who am I? Does anybody know who I am? For birds, especially birds, I'm not very good with them. Or for insects or flowers. And people will usually respond to me. But I also, for insects, if it's not a big, flashy, showy insect like a butterfly, it can be hard to do on iNaturalist. There's not enough for the artificial intelligence to draw from. And so you can go to other sites like Bug Guide, where they have entomologists that will check out pictures that are put online. And they will oftentimes let you know what it is, especially if you can get a pretty sharp image of that particular um, insect. Now, all, most of these on here I definitely took with my camera equipment, but I have put up photos onto the site that I've taken with my cell phone. Perfectly fine, as long as you get it pretty clear. But I'm going to go through and just talk about a few other individual insects before we wrap up today's talk. And a couple years ago, I was out here on campus, and there was a couple of these bees, and they were pollinating this white wild indigo that we have. It's a beautiful plant. Look at those flowers. And I was like, wow, this is a beautiful insect. It's yellow almost from its head to its end of its abdomen or butt, right? And I wonder what it is. So I look it up online, going through that whole iNaturalist bug guide process, because I didn't know what it was. And I found out it was the golden northern bumblebee. What an appropriate name. It lives in the north, and it's golden yellow. I love it when the names make sense. And as I looked, I realized that this is another one of those insects that has undergone one of those sad, steep declines, about 90%. This was once a very common bee you'd see all over the place. Like I see those brown belted bumblebees I showed you earlier. They were everywhere. But they had a problem. They lost their habitat, which is a preferred grassland habitat. But look, at campus, we have over 30 acres 
of restored and prairie, and we have ponds, and we have woodland, and we have the space for the habitat for a lot of these insects and other species. We do get endangered bird species and everything else coming through our natural areas. And this one has a nice home here. And so by having this prairie on campus, we can not only enjoy it for ourselves, but we can help out these vulnerable and threatened species, like this beautiful pollinator that you see right there. And sometimes, even after I identify something, I don't really understand what it is or what I actually saw. So a couple years ago, two years ago, I was in the Indiana Dunes National Park, walking along. I'm like, wow, that's weird. An orange caterpillar and a butterfly milkweed. I only know of two caterpillars that eat milkweed, the monarch being one of them. I was like, oh, that's weird. Let me take a couple pictures. I'll put it on Facebook. <laughs> I joke you not. I put everything on Facebook. And not everything. I'm like, oh, hey, what is this? And I looked it up online also, and it's the unexpected tiger moth. I'm like, that's cool, and I put it away for two years. I go on a talk last, or walk last week, um, led by a person I know, and I'm like, oh, this will be fun. And at the end, he's like, where did you take a picture of that caterpillar that I saw online? He's like, that's a really rare caterpillar. I'm like, hmm, I'll look into this a little bit more. And so Sunday night, as I was making this talk, I look it up, and oh look, it is a state-threatened insect in the state of Indiana, which means it's state-threatened at least here in Illinois, because we're right by each other. So I thought that was cool. Even though I've had this picture for two years, I'm still learning a little bit more about it. And that's the power of being able to go on the internet versus 20 years ago. And I do mean that because when I was here on campus, you got, we got the first two computers in the library that connected to the internet. So I was here at the beginning, and I had no idea it would explode so well or that I'd like it so much. And this is the last individual one that I'll talk about. And these restorations are great, but I've also mentioned we can't just um, restore all the prairie and destroy all the remnants. We lose all that genetic diversity, but we also lose a lot of other insects. Again, I put this, took a picture of this moth that I found on, once again, Blazing Star, but on their seeds at this remnant prairie, this little seven acre remnant in Indiana. And a couple hours later, a DNR guy that I know online, he said, I think it's this Blazing Star borer moth. That's really, really rare. It hasn't been seen in the state of Indiana in 15 years. I'm like, cool. So I, I looked into it. Sure enough, that's what it is. And earlier, we saw that burn. I talked about all this great stuff that burning prairies does. This is what prairie needs. The problem is you don't want to burn the entire prairie all at once. You want to burn parts of it. Because when you burn the entire thing, you lose species like this. This is a species that lays its eggs in the grass. And so when we burn prairies or woodlands, because we do that too, we tend to burn in the fall, late fall and spring. And a lot of these insects, like this rare moth, they'll get burned up. And then they're gone from that site. And so knowing that something is there and showing that fo those photographs of these rare insects or animals that are found at these different preserves, restoration or remnant, can really help influence management and could also help people appreciate, hopefully, the area that they have. Because this, this is owned by a company. This is not a protected remnant. Just like the natural areas on campus aren't protected aside from the fact that we like to have natural areas on campus. Okay, so here's my second video. And this is just me walking down the street, and everything in this is a native plant except this one, and that was because I like hummingbird moths. Um, but everything else in here is just me walking up and down my driveway about a month and a half ago, taking video with my phone of some of the insects and pollinators and predators with that dragonfly that I saw along my driveway. And I pretty much never had to leave my driveway to do this. Didn't have to go off on the grass, nothing. Sitting on pavement. 
And so this is one of the reasons why we encourage people to plant native plants. And that's one of the things that I really like to do. So I volunteer and I donate a lot of these pictures that I take. Because if I don't share these photos, I can take the most beautiful photos of plants and animals. If I don't share them, what's the point? Right? It just sits on a digital hard drive until it degrades into nothingness, right? I don't want that. And so this is a guide I helped with this summer, this past spring and summer. And it is insects that you could find in your yard, especially if you plant native plants. And so it'll talk a bit about what you should plant. It's a five page guide. And these are available for free download from the Field Museum. And if I go and I type in rap field guides or rapid field guides Field Museum, I'll find out they have a ton of free downloadable guides for just about anything nature related that I want to know about. I want to know about moths, here's a page for you, a guide. I want to know about seeds, here's a guide for you. I want to know about mollusks, there's a guide for you. And they're all free for download. And you can even click on a drop down link and say, I just want to look at the Chicago region. I don't care about what's in Ecuador because I'm not in Ecuador, though it's important. I do care about what I can see around me here in the Chicago region. And I also helped work on this guide, which came out last year in Indiana. It's meant for Indiana due to a grant. It has to be just for the three collar counties in Indiana. But it works for the entire upper Midwest, especially here in the Chicago region. It's a 20 page guide that will go through and tell you different insects you can find in your yard. Tell, gives you information on plants, gives you landscape design information so you can help plan things in your yard. And it just won an award and I get to go to that award ceremony Thursday in Chicago. So we do have these ways we can use our photography. And if we don't use our photography, what are we taking pictures for? All you photography students out there. Okay. And I'm pretty much at the end of my talk. And I just want to say, again, I wouldn't be here without my dad, right there in the center. And that's at his prairie restoration out in Iowa, those two pictures. And then the first one is my little dude uh, out here at the Chicago, or uh, at the College of DuPage Prairie uh, last year next to a prairie dock leaf. So when people said, well, how big is your baby? I'd be like, oh, about the size of a prairie dock leaf. <laughs> right? And I know I showed some leaves to people on this morning's walk. So I do like that. And I got to tell you, I'm really easy to find. And yes, I do take pictures of more things than insects, believe it or not. But super easy, SusanKurtPhotography.com. Facebook, Instagram, Susan Kurt Photography. My email address, Susan at Susan Kurt Photography. So if you want to find out more about me or you want to contact me, I tried to make it really, really, really easy. Okay. But after this talk, uh, about probably about 2.15, we are going to be able to go out and take a walk on the prairie. We are in that red building, the map that I circled, and we're going out to the ecological study area. This is where the Chicago, the prairies here at the College of DuPage started. This is where the first restorations were, and so we could walk around that area and see the early restorations. And then we can go and see the restorations that took place in the 80s and 90s. On the other side, on Wednesday, September 28th, I did not circle it, but if I go behind the science building, that long red building you see, where it says Russell R. Kurt Prairie, we're gonna meet um, right by there. There's a little pavilion behind the building that we'll be meeting at at 4.30 for a walkthrough. And Linda Randa, who teaches prairie ecology, will be along on that talk also, or on that walk. So I can talk about uh, photography, and then she could help talk about all the different types of plants we are seeing and information about their background. All right, and I think that's just about all I had.
right, so we can take some questions for Susan, if anybody has any questions. Yes, the gentleman in the mask. <laughs> or I'm so sorry. Yes. In the mask. The white socks. <laughs> gentleman, yes. I've been doing uh, nature photography for some time now, and I noticed that this particular summer, the insect populations were way down, particularly butterflies. And I spend most of my time in Kane County Forest Preserve. Mm -hmm. They burned every forest preserve this year, all of them. Um, and, and it seems they're doing it more and more frequently. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think is the appropriate interval for burns? So I'll give the answer that nobody likes. It depends. <laughs> so a lot of it depends on the habitat. So a wetland, like a marsh, isn't going to be burned as often, hopefully, as a woodland or a prairie. And it also depends on what stage, if I'm doing a restoration or I'm completely reconstructing a habitat on, say, an old farm field. If it's early on, you may want to burn it more. A lot of people will, at least, because you're trying to keep down those invasive plants and then maybe back off a little bit later on. But I have noticed over the decades that there has been a very uh, ups and downs on the amount of burning that happens. And sometimes lots of things get burned. And then the next decade, there's a big pullback for some reason. And sometimes it's political. Sometimes it's new ecological studies. But it changes all the time. And I think we're still figuring it out. There's still a lot of people studying burning. Not a bad thing to get your master's or PhD in, right? Like, oh darn, I got to go to another prairie burn. I go burn down another 20 acres on my campus where I'm going to school or that job site over there, right? So not the worst thing to study, but it is, it is something that I think we're still trying to figure out. And it is still a relatively new field. We think, OK, we've had a few decades. Restorations really took off in the 80s and 90s. But we still don't know a lot. We don't know a lot of what's even out there under our feet. And we're trying to learn it. So um, Laura Ricky Anchor, co-author of the mm -hmm. Chicago region, has been for the last 40 years studying the, uh, the bees and the two mm -hmm. grasslands, where they burn every year. Now, they don't burn every single area every year. Mm -hmm. But they do burn every single year. And they don't burn, they don't do growing season burns. Mm -hmm. They only do grow, dormant season burns. And there is more bee diversity in the shoes of grasslands than there is anywhere else in the Chicago region. There are about 500 species of bees mm -hmm. that have been documented from the Chicago region. And of those, almost half of them are in the shoes up. And she attributes that to the regular burns. But the timing of the burn is what's really critical. Mm -hmm. And knowing, as you say, knowing your habitat, when is the best time? When is the best, uh, uh, where's the best the timing for that particular area? If we don't, if we don't burn, then of course we're going to be um, letting the invasives take mm -hmm. over. And it's not just the invasive. A lot of areas around here would go back to woodlands also um, if we didn't do burning. Burning is necessary in a lot of restorations and a lot of remnant populations and a lot of remnant areas. And we're still trying to figure that out, though. And when we talk about bees, I think bees are really cool. They're great pollinators. They're cute. The United States has about 20,000 native bees, and probably the one that most people have heard about or heard the most about is the honeybee, which is <coughs> from Europe and Asia. And I got to tell you, I love honey. I really do. but. I'm not trying, I don't usually try to encourage honeybees in my yard or in restorations that I do. Because there is competition, there is some evidence coming out that they could pass along different um, pests and other things to the native bee population. So they could actually be hurt sometimes by the introduction of honeybees. There's a lot of research going on right now. And so it's going to be interesting to see how that, that plays out. And a lot of, even our native bees, some do nest underground. A lot of our bumblebees do. But a lot of other bees are actually up in the stems. That's where they're overwintering. Same thing with a lot of our other insects 
and all those other animals, those voles and you know, foxes and everything else that are still out there on the prairie, if you burn the whole thing, you're really reducing the amount of food they have to eat as they try to get through winter. It was mentioned dormant season burning. That's fall and early spring when the plants above ground are dead. I've only seen one small little patch burn once in the summer, which would have happened in the past. And that was um, at a re big remnant. Um, and I think they were doing a little bit of a study on, on that. Um, something called the Ginsburg Markham Prairie. And it's been years since I saw that where there's thousands and thousands of acres. And a big part of that is cost. Sometimes you can get grants for this. And a lot of it depends on what species you're putting in. There's a very traditional mix now out, depending on what, how wet your soils are. A lot of times you get 20 to 30 species of, with seeds when you buy them from different companies. You can add more plants to that, but that costs more. And so it depends on what your goal is as the person trying to restore an area. And if you want to use seed, seed only, or if you want to add um, plants that are grown, like we saw people planting actual plants out on the prairie, um, you're going to get different initial success rates. Uh, seeding is more of long-term planning, but if I want instant gratification, you'd go with, with actual plants. And the nice thing is most of these are perennial, so they'll come back year after year after year after year. Once you get through the first couple of years, it makes it a little bit easier to manage. Other questions? Oh, I think I'm left. Okay, yes. Yeah, so, um, like going off on restoring, I, um, me and my mom were trying to get um, our front and backyard with some native species, and like, we have this lady come and give us a quote. Okay. Right? Um, first off, it's, it'd be good to know what your yard looked like. So it'd be one of those things where it's almost easier to talk person to person about because what happens if your yard is really shady? Does it flood? Is this old fill? Like, was there a gravel parking lot there before your house was built? All of this is going to impact what plants would do well there. And there are a lot of places that will sell native plants. Um, there's a lot of Nursery, native plant nurseries. There are lots of your forest preserves and other organizations will do plant sales. So you can buy those plants, which we usually call plugs, to put in. Um, so there's a lot of, and you can also buy seed, um, even online at some reputable seed companies um, to put out there. And I usually do a mix. Some plants, some seeds, but if I plant things, I have to take care of them for the summer, which takes a while. So I definitely go the longer, slower approach usually in my yard. <laughs> yes? Oh, just to finish up as well, um, so I was studying architecture before I switched to an art major. Okay. And we had a project where we um, designed like bee actually, or um, apiary projects. So it was for the bees to, mm -hmm. you know, make sure they're getting, you know, the nutrients, the water supply. I don't know um, if that's really something that's easy to do at the So I'd have to punt that to people who are here on campus. I'm not going to lie. Um, but our prairie manager, his last day was actually, our natural areas manager, his last day was actually on Friday. And so hopefully the college will be putting out a job advertisement to try to get a new person to come in soon. That's what everybody wants. And that's something that he or she would be involved in then. So we're kind of at like this awkward point right now where we're in between people. Literally by one business, or two business days. <laughs> Literally that much. So he left on Friday. And yeah, so if we did something like the, uh, to help increase the populations of native bees, because we do have beehives here on campus for honeybees, you do have to build in like the maintenance and cleaning and stuff. Um, I did talk about how a lot of native bees will nest in like stems. 
So there is a big push now, you'll see them even at Menards, these kind of like bee hotels. But they can also attract pests, and it can attract fungi, and it can be good or it could be bad, and it depends on what materials you're using and if you're maintaining them. Um, or if you're just even just drilling holes in logs for insects to go into. There's a wide variety of things you can do. I've never gotten that into it. I've read a bit about it, though, um, and I've seen some of them. But that would definitely be something I think would be really interesting to see. Yes? Are, are you seeing any new uh, plants or insects um, that might be here because of climate change, things that have migrated from the south? Um, gosh. So usually when I see new insects, like new, new insects, it's because they're pests from other parts of the world, like those stink, brown stink bugs that get into our houses from Asia. Um, and the big one that we're just starting to get new insects of individuals showing up in Indiana and Illinois is the um, spotted lanternfly, which is a, like a leaf tree hopper thing. And it's, it can be really pretty, but if you go out east, these were brought in, both of these were brought in accidentally. They just cover the trees and they're killing everything. And it's, it's a miserable looking nightmare out there. And we're gonna get them. There's no stopping them. Um, we just haven't gotten a big infestation yet. But that's the next thing I'm not looking forward to. And for me, we are seeing plants and animals moving up from down south. So, like, there's armadillos now in southern Illinois. We're seeing some of the invasive plants like kudzu uh, down south, which kind of blankets all the plants and smothers the plants in these ecosystems, including trees. Kudzu has been found in the Chicago region, and they've been killed. But you have to have somebody who knows what it looks like and knows how to take care of it. And not everybody does. And so it wouldn't surprise me if in the future we start to see more and more of those things. And we're losing plants and animals because it's getting warmer and they're moving further north um, where they have a little bit better climate for them. So we're losing them here, but they may exist still, say, in Michigan and Wisconsin or in Canada. And plants, animals, it's happening all around. So good things I'm really excited to see, I don't know, <laughs> honestly. But it is always changing. So, yes? Um, OK. This is a hypothetical. OK. So say um, the college got more land. Mm -hmm. How much money would go into restoring it? I don't even know if I uh, am. I would guess not a ton. Okay, I'm not going to go and try to say numbers, but I'm going to say probably not a lot. And some of the things that, are, that happen here on campus are actually done through grants that, say, the previous prairie manager applied for. Um, and yeah, probably not a lot. What's a grant? So a grant is when you go to other people and you write a report and say, please give me money. And you're hoping that they say, yes, you gave me money. And so that's how I have gotten several pieces of, of equipment, a drone, a mechanical rail for my camera so I can do stacked photography or do time-lapse photography with it. I just got a really awesome trail camera system that professionals use. Um, all these things I got through grants. So people gave me money so I could purchase these things. And... Um, just got another one to do a lot of printing for insects that we could find in our yards. Um, so that's something I'll do next year. And usually you have to have a project and you have to give results and write a report at the end of some period, say like a year, and say, this is what I used your money for. This is the outreach I did with what you gave me. These are the signs I made. This is X, Y, Z. And so you can do that with photography, and you can do that with restoration. You can do that with a bunch of different um, fields. You just have to find the people that want to give you money. And then beat out all the other people who wanted money, <laughs> honestly. 
So, and depending on what you're looking for, it's easier or harder uh, to do. Yes? How, how do you get depth of field with a macro lens? So, mac that is a good question. So, with a macro lens, depth of field, which means how much of that organism is actually in focus, is incredibly, incredibly small. So, if I take a, re a picture, say, of a landscape, and say I took a picture of this one right here. Probably not the best example. I don't have a lot of landscapes in this, uh, in this PowerPoint talk. But I can look and I can see that there's some sharpness on this side of the plant and on the other side. So it's a kind of a big depth of field. But when I start to get closer and closer and closer, I lose that. And so when I look, say, at this lemon cuckoo bee, again, one of my favorite bees, I got the head in focus and most of the body. But if I look at that foreleg closest to me, totally blurry. And if I start to look further back along its back, I'll see that those hairs aren't in really good focus anymore either. I've taken this entire bee that's like this long, this wide, and I've only got about that much in focus. But again, I got the eye. And so we like that picture. Now, to get around that, there's something called stacking, where I take my camera, and I do this mostly outside, handheld, um, which probably drives some people nuts. But I can go and I can take two or three, four pictures of an insect. They move, so it's hard to do more than that, handheld. I can do more if I'm doing a flower or a leaf or some other object. And I'm focused here in one picture, here, the next picture, here in the next picture. And then in Photoshop or some other stacking programs, I can combine them all together. And the programs will say like, okay, this part's sharp in this image, that part's sharp in the next image. And it smooshes them together. I could also get rail systems where I can program in to the system saying, hey, I want you to take pictures. These, I want to take you 100 pictures of this one object. And you're going to go on a rail, and you're going to move forward this amount every single picture. Picture, 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 picture. Maybe it's 70. And then I'll put that in a program, and I'll smush it all together. And that's when you get really way more sharp images, and that's what I did on these two moth pictures. I used a rail system, one of the few pictures you'll see here that I, probably the only pictures you see here that I actually did on a tripod. And so that is the way that I'd get really sharp pictures really close up. And I guess here's a landscape picture. It's, I'd have a lot of stuff in focus, but there's still a range, those trees in the way far background, which are across a, tr a road, are going to be a little bit more blurry. So that's a deep depth of, really big depth of focus. <laughs> But yeah, that is the bane of macro photography. It's how much can you get in focus. And if you're just doing flowers, definitely get, pick what you want in focus, what you think is most interesting in that flower, and make sure that's in focus. And so the rest could be blurry. It's usually the center of the flower you want in focus. But flowers have different shapes, so. All right, so I think that's it. We're done. All right, let's get Susan. And thank you all thank for you. coming and staying. All right, everyone, thank you so much for coming. And our next visiting artist series is actually going to be with Brian Harper on Tuesday, October 18th in the Playhouse Theater. So we'd like to see you then as well.